Hey folks, thanks for being here with me. Uh, another one of these videos, by, by now you all know the routine. You will note that I have switched to uh, winter mode here. It's not winter yet, but it's getting cooler. And I, I, I know Jen's way, I think there might actually be some snow. It's the same t-shirt. Now I just have another shirt on top of it. This completes my transition to cold weather mode. So Jen, you and I, we're gonna start, we have a, a policy of very proactively acknowledging when we make corrections or alterations to anything that we've published. And uh, if, if we just correct the spelling of someone's name because we botch it, we don't we don't note that. We just, we just fix the typo. Um, but substantial changes we we do note. We published a piece earlier this week um, that was from us collectively, the line editors, where we had talked about Krista Freeland. Uh, her comments recently have changed. Uh, the tone of her comments have changed. Our analysis is that this reflects a uh, greater concern among Freeland and others about the state of the Canadian economy. One of the things we did, though, uh, the piece was informed by a series of conversations you and I had with different people, with all anonymous uh, for, for our purposes here. Before we ran the piece, I checked to make sure that I had accurately reflected the views of one of the people I talked to. And then I had, I don't know much about this stuff. It was about the bond market in particular. I then went and I had someone else look at it and go, yeah, that, that's fine. We published it. And then within about an hour, we started to get notes from, from people who were telling, eh, you know what, that's not exactly, like, you guys didn't get it quite right. You haven't explained it properly. So just, just, just to be clear, what we didn't explain properly, apparently, was that uh, there was an assumption that if we have to start going to shorter term bonds that the that the that the yields those bonds will command will be a little bit higher because traditionally that's kind of how it goes longer term bonds tend to be you know um uh, uh cheaper cheaper money than shorter term bonds because you need you know for, for a lot of different interesting reasons but that's not always the case I, I don't even know if it's even typically the case anymore, because here's the thing. So basically, th that is right. Basically, the, 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 the dispute was what bonds will carry the highest interest rate? Will it be the short, the medium or the long? And our original version of the piece had said uh, that it would be the long. That was contested. So I'm going to relay, and I think I think the, the, the viewers will enjoy this, Jen, and you and I had a laugh about this yesterday, what happened next. But... There's an element here that you don't actually know about this. Oh, I, I wear contact lenses. I scratched my eye a few days ago and it's, it's fine, but like I needed just some drops, like medicated drops to, to settle it down. And I have an eye, uh, an eye exam next week just to make sure it's fine. I can already tell it's getting better, but my doc, the doc says, go see your eye doctor next week. So that's coming up next week. But what happened yesterday was my eyes were exhausted, they were dry, they were irritated, I had these drops in them, and I took my contact lenses out really early. I need contact lenses. I like Without them, I can't see. And I'm thinking, well, you know what? The kids are home from school. I've uh, Everything we've published for the day is published. I can be blind now. I can take these things out. And I take them out, and like, 20 minutes after this, I start getting notifications that were wrong in some really arcane economic detail. And I have to put in one contact lens so that I can read, but I don't want to put in the other one. So the first thing I start doing is re reaching out to business journalists, uh, economics PhDs, uh, current economics professors, retired economics professors. Ultimately, I talked to seven people and then an eighth got back to me later. And I'm talking to them and I'm reading their emails and I'm dictating and I'm typing, but I'm doing it like this because <laughs> this eye is sore. Like I'm like a pirate. Like, so I'm, I'm like editing, like, and I'm reading everything. <laughs> Like my son came downstairs at one point. I was like, like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just, I'm just reading, but I only have one contact lens in. So I spent like two hours like this trying to make <laughs> sense of it all. Like editing without your contact lenses in is hard. The, the main takeaway though, is like I said, we asked uh, in the end, we had seven people review what we had said. Four said it was wrong enough to be worth fixing. Two said it was generally right but we didn't get it exactly right one of them said we more or less had it but then added so many qualifiers that i completely lost the plot i, I never blame our sources for this this is always failures in our understanding like their mega genius brain knowledge gets put into our mortal brains and we translate it wrong so the, the mistakes are always on our end ultimately like this i just gave up 
and decided we would just remove the contentious sentences from the piece because we didn't want to misinform people. Ladies and gentlemen, full transparency. That's what happened on, on Wednesday with the piece. We have noted that we have clarified it. Never get into arcane technical arguments <laughs> with economists. Economists, like, never do this. Like just with, never. with like an oozy, gross, scratched eye. It was That was the second most painful part of my Wednesday. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're not going to waste any of that good research that uh, you did, Matt. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll chat a little bit about what you learned and we'll put it in the dispatch. Yeah. We'll totally disclose it. We'll be like, look, here's why we took the sentences out. Uh, uh, here seems to be like the issue of contention in the dispute. So this is an interesting little side note, a factoid about inverse bond yield curves that maybe you didn't know before, but here's, 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 some, here's some information that we aren't going to waste. We're going to put it in the dispatch. And I'm going to insist that everyone read it with one eye. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Cover your eye and and like irritate it slightly. And get, then, get the and full understand our pain. Get the full line editor experience. Read the dispatch this week like this. Um, all right. So uh, we will. Uh, yep, we'll we'll put that in the dispatch. Um, as much to amuse the readers as it is to have our own transparency. Uh, let's talk about editing though, because um, this is something else that cropped up this week. When when either mistakes or even dispute that we couldn't make sense of because we don't understand the stuff enough come up, the traditional thing is to to make the the alteration online and note it. Um, this is when you are wrong about something. When you have gotten something wrong in a, in a way that would be a, a disservice to the readers. The CBC, in, in recent the week or weeks, I'm not sure exactly the time frame, has been doing something else. They have been retroactively wanting to change copy, not because it was wrong, but because, but because it proved to be unpopular. Yeah. yeah, it was unpopular or contentious. Did this on two different pieces, and I mean, from really different uh, ideological perspectives. One was, of course, the, um, I mean, we wrote about that a little bit, a trans writer talking about how some trans activism has just gone sort of wildly over the line. You know, uh, after it was published, it sounds like she was asked to change some minor things and add, add some things. And then the editor kept on pushing, presumably because the editor kept on getting more pressure. And she was asked to, 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 to I don't know if it was actually, it was a he or a she, I don't know what the pronouns are. So apologies there. But um, anyway, I think she identifies as a female. Um, so eventually she just said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to change this anymore. And then she tweeted out the actual comments from, from an editor. And, you know, as someone who works on the, the opinion side of the CBC, that is not normal. It, it is not normal or acceptable for an editor to be like, after something's published, I want you to add stuff in or change stuff. That's, that's totally not kosher. Um, and then there was another piece about basically an elections Canada wor worker who did like a first person style piece about how she basically assumed that everybody who voted um, for conservatives were bigots. Like she was a mind reader. It was quite uh, remarkable. Uh, obviously, this is the sort of piece that bluntly was dumb and awful and a clear example of just like if you had reasonable, rational people on your desk would have just killed this kind of a piece. It would never have run. It just it just was a really, you, you could write an opinion piece or an opinion analysis basically arguing that you thought why you think every single you know conservative voter is really a bigot, but you can't like hide that under first person and just you know mind read into people's like assumptions and motivations that way. Like it just, it, it was really silly. And so in both cases, there were just substantive rewrites of a, of a contentious piece um, that were happening. And John Kay gets credit for this because then he pointed out and he got, you're right, he got uh, CBC dead to rights on this. So we got to give Kay credit on that. Um, right. And I think that what's, what's no notable from, from both of these examples is that like, firstly, uh, especially in the second case, just bad editorial judgment, just really, really bad editorial judgment. And secondly, bad judgment or no, once a piece is published, it's published. You can't go back and substantively rewrite it. Like you just, you just can't, but it's, it's, how should I say this? Amateurish isn't beginning to describe this. That is, that's, that's literally, you know, high school level, you know, university level 
stuff, the antics that I would expect at that level. It's not professional journalism. It's not at a professional journalism standard. It's, it's extremely juvenile. Like we wouldn't do that at the line. Like, you know, I don't think like no, no, no professional journalistic outlet would engage in that behavior. It's just, it's just, it's, 19 year olds like my old my old high school newspaper royal high school newspaper wouldn't do that my university paper the eye opener wouldn't do that like it 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 it's mind-blowingly unprofessional and amateurish i i didn't read the uh the piece by the trans author so i i did see the tweets by the author kind of revealing the uh pleading very polite pleading emails from CBC editors saying, Hey, we're getting a lot of pushback. Can we maybe change this a bit? I didn't read the piece. Like once I saw that the editors were asking to retroactively change stuff. Um, that's all I need to know. I yeah. did read the piece from the elections volunteer uh, herself, a woman of color recounting how in her mind, every time she was meeting a white voter, she was wondering, hmm, I wonder if this person hates me. I wonder if this person's a bigot. Had a really lovely chat with an older white woman and was wondering, hmm, is this a bigot? That's an example of a piece where you're not making the point you were thinking you were making. That's no. what our, our very online friends would call telling on yourself. Um, and, this well, and also like there's there's a way to write that piece you know what I mean like there, yes. there's, there's totally a way to write this piece where you can do this like like with good editing and good help and and, and some some proper you know editorial judgment there's nothing wrong with writing a piece about look this is why I think all CPC voters are bigots or you know this is what I deal with in my day-to-day -day life dealing with white people being concerned about the fact that they're bigots like there's there's a way to get at that core but you need to you be self-aware. Do you don't do it the way it's done. You need to go do it with a degree of self-awareness and you need to have some good editorial sort of guidance to make sure that you're communicating what you're trying to communicate. Like, I'm not trying to trash the writer. This is actually like, everybody as a writer will write a piece that, 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 that doesn't quite work, right? Like, this is actually the fault of the editor. Oh, no, it entirely is. No, yeah, and yeah. this is, I was trying to explain to someone once because, I mean, as an editor, I shall, I shall note obliquely, there have been pieces that have been run under my watch uh, that did not go over well. And some of the times it was because there were breakdowns in the editing process and you have to investigate what they were and you have to try and figure out a way to do it better. Other times though, I guess someone asked me this once, someone had asked me, what happens when someone who writes for you wants to say something really stupid? And it, it actually is a somewhat nuanced answer because as an editor, you typically kind of have three gradients of, of pieces you're dealing with. One of them is the, the pitch out of the blue from someone you have no existing relationship with. And if it's stupid, you go, eh, nah, done. The other one is from someone who is not one of your regular roster, but you do have an established relationship with. Someone you work with before, someone you have an expectation you'll work with in the future. If they want to say something bonkers, you can shoot it down but you are it's awkward like so you might say to him hey thanks for this i think you know you say it politely but i think x y and z about this is weird when someone is a regular either staff or freelance columnist they largely are going to say what they want and the the editor can can push back on on issues of, of factual accuracy on uh libel like that don't get sued stuff like that but a columnist has a right to their opinion and it, it is a very delicate relationship between the editor and the columnist my read of the cbc piece is that there was no obligation the cbc was no. under to run that piece especially no. not in the form that it was going in after the fact to try and and work with it is as you say, it's amateur hour, but I think it's, there's, as a long serving editor, I actually have a, a different take to this as well, particularly when you're dealing with relatively inexperienced authors or even people who've maybe had a lot of uh, uh, publications before, but they aren't part of the family, so to speak, you have to take care of them. You have to protect your writers. The, the editors at the CBC should have said, hey, really interesting article. We'd love to run a version of this, but you're making yourself sound like a paranoid bigot. And again, yeah. you, you say it nicer than that, but you have to try and look after your people. The greatest- But the, but the, but the problem I think in this case, and this is just having some insight into to the situation of the CBC, 
was that uh, the, the person, the people who in, were in charge of approving that piece weren't able to see that that's what it made their writer look like. So it, they were just blind, like they didn't. Correct. They, yeah. And the, here's where we get into like the, the general problem with the ideological bent of the CBC and the way, the degree to which what yeah. we would call the successor ideology has basically consumed the entire group mind of that organization. They have no one on staff, like, I mean, bluntly, like you or me, to flag for them that that piece was not, made them look crazy. There was just nobody in the, in the editorial process to, to be like, um, e e guys. So, okay, like, you have some, problem. you have some insight here. I don't. Was the editorial process properly adhered to? Because I would, I would say, and again, I'm being oblique about this, the greatest meltdown I ever directly oversaw was one where the editorial process due to human error did not function properly did the process so of the that 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 assumes there's a no that assumes there's a there's a process as opposed to a great deal of um lack of understanding in the cbc about what qualifies as opinion versus analysis versus first person so this is a, this is a tension that the cbc has had for a number of years where they've tried to get into the opinion game but they're not comfortable being in the opinion game so they don't have standards yeah. around how opinion act, what opinion is and how it works. And so they're trying to reconcile opinion with their uh, journalistic standards and practices. And um, I don't know if I'm telling tales out of school, but I actually applied for, for a job there at the CBC many, many years ago to, to run their opinion section. And it was very clear to me at that point that this was an organization that, that didn't have a clear, a clear direction for what they wanted to do with their opinion section. And that lack of direction leads exactly to problems like this, because there's no clear standard for what is a first person piece. There's no clear standard for what is, a, what is an opinion piece. And when you compound that lack of just clear understanding of what you're, what's appropriate for your organization and what isn't, and you compound that with um, bluntly just just bad editorial um, judgment. And I, I, can't, I can't put this in a nicer way than that. It's bad editorial judgment and, and insufficient layers of process embedding um, uh, uh, sort of um, compounded with that situation. This sort of a thing was, was absolutely bound to happen. Because like, like I said, there's nobody, there's nobody there who's a kind of centrist or a more conservative or a more sort of grounded, ideologically grounded person to be a second set of eyes on some of this stuff and be like, yeah, this isn't what you think it is. That's right? interesting. I mean, look, yeah, I, I obviously uh, have to defer to your better um, insight into this. I don't, I don't really have any. Um, question for you before we move on, because we got some other things on the agenda. Has the CBC addressed this in any way since it was noted? Not, the, not as far as I can tell. Not as far as I can tell. Hmm. Well, so you know, I, know, I, 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 I think that we are within our rights to go to town on the, on this, and I, I think well, we deserve it. I mean, we're we're filming this as always on a Thursday afternoon. We're not publishing the dispatch until tomorrow. Um, let's we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, like let, let's actually check to see if there's been any. Um, uh, res response from the CBC to it. So the uh, next item on the agenda, uh, I'll whip up something quick, or or you can if you want. Um, you, you being more at West than I have, I don't have a ton to say about the cabinet shuffle. Uh, I I do I did come up with a, a headline though that I want to use because obviously Western Canadians are are worried that um, uh, Minister Guibo, the new environment minister, is a bit of a, uh, a fuck you to the West, particularly the oil producing regions. And there's been some talk about maybe this represents a, a tonal shift. Maybe the PM's tired of of playing on Jason Kenney's term. Is like, oh yeah, you have a equalization reference? Well, guess what? Stephen uh, Guibo, he, he's the new environment minister, the, the former Greenpeace activist. So I have nothing substantive really to say about this. I will trust you to say something substantive about it. I do have the headline though. No yeah, more, I mean, no more Mr. Nice Gibo. And that headline is so good that now I feel like I have to write something for it in order just to justify the headline. That's the, that, that is um, exactly what, what we will do. All right. So you'll, yeah. you'll whip up. I, I don't know what I'm going to say about it because I mean, like, I, personally, I don't, I never really pay that much attention to cabinet shuffles, but I don't really care that much. Um, I did think this one was more interesting. Uh, this one's more interesting. I mean, Gibo's a, Gibo's a fucking nut. 
<laughs> I'm sorry to say it. He is. I'm. Sorry, I'm kind of glad that he's Gibo out of. Is a fucking nut. Uh, Minister Gibo is a fucking nut. Um, I mean, I'm glad to get him out of heritage because I don't really want him overseeing free speech issues. The internet. Like, I just internet. Like, I just don't want him near that. Um, I think I'd rather have him. <laughs> I think I'd rather have him on environment than than internet. Personally, um, so there you go. Uh, I mean, do I think that that. Uh, the Trudeau liberals are going to get harder on the oil sands in the next few years. Yes. I mean, during the, the, the campaign, I believe they were even saying stuff like they were going to talk about um, emissions caps. And emissions like caps, so, hard emissions cap. Yeah, yeah. hard emissions caps. Development can is, continue under the cap. Yeah. And I mean, by the way, this is what Notley had proposed back in 2015. So if, if the emissions yeah. cap is reasonable, it's not like it's catastrophic, but people will raise hell about it anyway. Um, so that's fine. Uh, so yeah, it, it will be interesting to see where that goes. It could be really bad for Alberta. It could be really radical. I don't. I don't know. But I don't know. I just. I hate. I hate making issues of cabinet shuffles. I don't really care about cabinet shuffles. A couple other points I would make about the cabinet shuffle uh, that are interesting. I've already written a whole column for the National Post this week where I talk about how Trudeau never wanted to admit there was a problem at defense. There were, oh, he would admit there was a problem within the armed forces. But at national defense, the government civilian bureaucratic side, no one wanted to do anything. And then, hey, look, cabinet shuffle. We're taking Anita Anand, currently probably the second most respected person in that cabinet. And we're ripping her off vaccine procurement and we're putting her at defense. That's a late signal that, oh, actually, maybe there is a problem on the government bureaucratic side as well. But I wrote that column already. Um Two other things that that we could comment on. Uh, one of them is very brief. Melanie Jolie was a surprise as um, foreign affairs minister. Um, not the most credible, competent minister given her, her early tenure. Um, getting a sudden big promotion. Conventional wisdom has very quickly said, oh, okay, but yeah, you're just an Anglo. You don't understand. She's huge in Quebec. Well, great. I'm huge in Japan. Like, it, like it, it, what actually makes more sense to me, though, a friend of mine, a, a conservative, but a, a friend of mine had said, oh, dear, poor Christia Freeland. I wonder if she realizes that Trudeau has chosen his successor. And I went, huh, because that aligns with what you and I have been saying about how Freeland is being put in a position to do nothing but block bullets for the yeah. next three or four years and to be clear yeah. i mean political metaphorical economic bullets not real ones but there's a hell of a mess to clean up when when this pandemic is over economically we're talking more and more about that inflationary pressures deficit pressures all that stuff freeland is gonna have to be the bad boss she's gonna have to send the kids to bed without any supper she's gonna have to put down some discipline here meanwhile melanie jolie sunny ways you know, ha happy, happy, hope changey. So I, I, I don't know. I don't pretend to know what the prime minister is thinking, but when my friend said to me, oh, poor Christia, she doesn't know that Trudeau, she might not realize that Trudeau signaled today who his preferred successor is. I went, oh, that actually. Well, and, and I mean, it, I mean, I don't know much about Melanie Jolie, but isn't the general consensus that she's kind of dumb? That has been how she has come across in, in English Canada. But then again, Quebecers Maybe. apparently like her okay all right interesting okay uh the other thing i would mention and this is not to dunk on on aaron at all um aaron wary at the cbc had a call about the um uh the shuffle and um he noted that it's trudeau setting himself up for what his legacy is right he's putting strong players uh, at least or at least well, he thinks they're strong in the files that actually matter kind of most to him you know reconciliation he's trying to fix that the environment he's trying to take a stronger stand there uh, Anand at defense would probably help get kind of like 16,000 women in uniform getting sexually harassed. So he's did the feminism front. What was funny though, is that um, the headline some CBC editor put on Aaron's column was like, uh, shuffle shows Trudeau as, as a PM in a hurry. He's been the PM for six years. He's not in a hurry. He's really, really late. And if there has been one sort of overriding meta narrative of Trudeau's time in office, it's rhetoric, accomplishment. 
And it's not that he hasn't had accomplishments. He has. He has had genuine policy successes, but he can't quite help himself. He promises things in maximalist terms, delivers something pragmatic and achievable. And then when people note the difference, he's like, well, if I got a folk conservative. So what's incredible to me is that if this is indeed, and I actually, I, I fundamentally agree with Aaron's thesis. I, like, I think Aaron has it basically right that Trudeau has built the cabinet he thinks will deliver the things he will retire on. It is entirely defensive. Like this is not about accomplishing new things. This is about not wanting to get called out as being um, two-faced on reconciliation, not wanting the sucking chest wound of the military sexual misconduct scandal, tarnishing his feminist bona fides, not wanting to be say that, uh, that he kowtow, that he bought a pipeline. Oh yeah, okay, I bought a pipeline, but then I sent a Greenpeace activist to go, mm -hmm. you know, put a cap on the oil sands. To the extent that these are legacy plays, they are 100% defensive. They are not about trying to do anything new. So we can we can stitch a bunch of these things together. We can figure out who will um, who will write what. I'm just mindful of the clock here. We've been gabbing for a while. Quick one for me. I was hard on Doug Ford last week in his dispatch because Doug Ford deserves it. You should be hard on Doug Ford because Doug Ford deserves it. There's more talk floating around about one of his daughters, a grown woman who is anti-vax. I don't care what his daughter thinks. She's a grown woman. Leave families of elected officials out of it. Like this is, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I, there's a certain federal politician I could name where there's a lot of speculation about the state of their marriage. We don't touch that. I, nope. suspect, I suspect some of our viewers know exactly who I'm talking about. We don't touch that because we don't nope, touch we the don't. families of the politicians. Uh, in one of the recent Ontario elections, maybe the last one, in fact, I have to go back and check this. Um, Andrea Horbath, who leads the Ontario NDP, uh, photos came out of her and her son, and her son uh, was perhaps not what people were expecting. Um, a lot of body art, a lot of uh, piercings. Um, Andrew Horvath being just a completely lovely person, very conventional in, in her presentation. People were surprised by her son, and the, the, the physical appearance of the son drew a lot of commentary, and people rightly shut that down, said, we don't talk about that. This is not about Andrew Harath's son. This is about the NDP, uh, the policies, and her conduct as leader. If Doug Ford does indeed have a daughter who's a little bit batty and anti-vax, she's an adult. He's not answerable for her, and we should leave her out of that. So uh sympathy for the doug uh i will um include that the only other thing and this is happening right now is we're probably just going to have some fun with this right now facebook uh ceo or whatever title is presidency i don't know mark zuckerberg is announcing the so-called metaverse which is sort of the next generation iteration of facebook and apparently it is heavily virtual reality based jen you and i do zoom calls all the time here comes my dog hey buddy we do zoom calls all the time we do phone calls all the time to communicate just about the daily plan or the weekly plan have you ever in the middle of one of those calls been thinking you know what would really take this experience up a notch what? if matt or i were in a virtual reality environment like has that ever occurred to you uh it's occurring to me right now in fact oh boy okay well two can play at this game hang on uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there we go all right like i said two complete Matt. so technically we're now possibly infringing on cbs patents and copyright so i'll probably have to put something in the credits saying not for commercial use satirical use only um but is this is this is this too soon too soon well you're getting snow in calgary aren't you we are not getting snow in Calgary. Don't don't libel us. Oh, I'm sorry. My mistake. I, I thought I'd seen that there would be snow in Calgary. Can I overlay those things you were doing with being on the bridge? Um, I, I'm sure you can. Absolutely. See. Yep. Yep. I am a pig on the bridge of a galaxy class starship. Possibly also a nebula class starship, depending on the bridge module. All right, so look, we will. I mean, puppy, you know how like every every couple of years, like 
Twitter rolls out some new feature and people are like, all I want is the edit button. Yes. Yeah. Like it's like Facebook is destroying democracy. And our response to this is you're going to do your meetings in virtual reality. Perfect. That's the future. Oh, okay. Like, like good. I like virtual reality. I have a virtual reality gaming system. I don't use it a lot because it takes time to set up and then you got to put like, put it on. Oh, that's lovely. Flowers in your hair. I mean, who doesn't love hydrangeas? No, it's okay if, the, if that's a hydrangea. Um, I, I, I'm not, I'm actually bullish, I would say, long term on the entertainment possibilities of virtual reality. When I played one of them uh, a few years ago, for the first time, I played one of the newer virtual reality gaming systems. I was like, oh my God, this is like first generation technology. And it was already an incredible experience. So I can see uh, real applications for virtual reality gaming and also in, in professional tasks, right? Like I could see surgeons uh, simulating stuff. I could see engineers simulating stuff. One of the most interesting things I've actually done in virtual reality is did a historical tour, because I'm a nerd, as you can see by the Starship I'm on, of mm -hmm. the Apollo 11 launch site as it existed mm -hmm. in 1969. So I'm actually, I'm very bullish on the, the possibility of, of education, professional and entertainment uses you for virtual reality. Holodeck. Submit you on a holodeck. I do want a holodeck, but I mean like that's, it's not plausible at this time. But Zuckerberg being like, hey, we've destroyed democracy oops but let's do your meetings in vr i'm sorry the one I mean, that press conference is happening now so maybe by the time it's over it'll be a more nuanced pitch than than all that but as of now it's not so it, yeah Any, anything else for the dispatch i got nothing so i'm gonna do uh cbc and gibo gibo do want, I mean, we under the give. I mean, under the give. Oh, there was something oh. else we were going to talk. I was going to talk about about uh, the, some of the tourists. I mean, I don't know. We've gone, we've gone pretty heavy on some of the trans stuff, but um, the fact that you know, uh, CTV did a thing on detransitioning, and uh, you know, the CBC actually ran a piece um, about you know two radical trans activism. I both thought that those were both interesting because I don't think either of those pieces would have run six months ago. Yeah, you think the, um, the the social movement may have peaked, um, sort of. Not, the... not, not peaked, because I mean, you don't want to say peaked, because I mean, watch what happens in six months. But I do think that, you know, the the the, the conversational space is, is finally opening up a little bit on some of this stuff. Maybe the, the, maybe the so-called Overton window is shifting. Yeah, back. the Overton window is more like shifting back a, t a tiny bit, yeah. I just realized now the way this virtual background is set up is like I'm sitting in a chair directly in front of the main view screen, but not actually at any of the bridge stations, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I will find a, a better one. If you wanna whip something up for that, by all means. Oh, that one actually, sorry, Jen, the problem is, cause I'm talking, you talk for a second. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm talking, now you can see. Yeah, that one actually looks quite realistic. That's the best one so far. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I just wanna do like a little paragraph on that because like I said, we've already gone pretty heavy on some trans issue stuff and I don't okay. wanna to overdo it. Well, and we will poke around um, with some of our, our other colleagues, see if there's anything they want to contribute, but uh, I think is enough for this week's dispatch. So thanks, everybody. And Jen, Jen, speak once more so they can see you in your chef regalia. We look forward to cooking up a great dispatch for you.